you thought they were extinct. But now they're back. Mastodon! Pterodactyl! Triceratops! Saber Tooth Tiger! Tyrannosaurus! You know, the way that commercial is cut, it could make someone interpret that the Rangers themselves were extinct. Hello everyone, and welcome to the premiere episode of Observing the Viewing Globe, or Eliza's Power Rangers Legacy. My name, as could be gathered by that, is Eliza, your guide through this retrospective on Power Rangers history. In just two years, Power Rangers will be 30 years old, and while there may have been some years where nothing new aired, it has been mostly ongoing, though it stopped being continuous after about season six or seven, depending on your point of view. My own personal history with Power Rangers is a bit complicated, although that is because when it came out in 1993, me and my childhood best friend had been working on a series of childish short stories that we printed and released through our elementary school for over a year that also focused on a team of brightly colored heroes that used combining dinosaur mecha. Simultaneous discovery can be a bit annoying sometimes. However, that is not why we are here today. Maybe someday, down the road, I'll discuss Robot Suits, the series me and my childhood friend created, the same time ZU Ranger was going on in Japan, but this series is about Power Rangers. Specifically, I will be watching and reviewing every episode of Power Rangers in order, with hopes to reach this final episode of Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers, coinciding on August 28th of 2023, the exact day of the 30th anniversary of Power Rangers as it would be a good way to celebrate the franchise by reaching the first major milestone of the series, the end of the Mighty Morphin era, on its 30th anniversary. That means I have about 166 episodes and a couple of specials to go through in a couple of years. Now, if this format seems familiar to anyone, yes, I am wholesale ripping off Swade's Pokemon Journey, of which I am a fan. I may also do a large series overview when done, but being since a lot of my thoughts on Power Rangers are similar to what those held by one Linkara, granted there are a few seasons I have differing opinions, I would have to think of a way to do that where I would not be, you know, repeating a lot of the same points. However, it has been almost 10 years since I last watched all of Power Rangers, so my views may have changed. With that all said, the following points will not be discussed. The Sentai. I am sorry if you are a fan of Super Sentai, but this is about Power Rangers, not Sentai. The only time Sentai may be covered is if there is some fun trivia I want to discuss at the end of each episode. Vasquez Rock and other landmarks, consistently used for multiple different locations by the series. Everyone has made jokes about this, and I do not intend to. If you want to talk about those in the comments, go ahead, I just won't partake. Ah! After 10,000 years, I'm free! Alpha, we just escaped. Recruit a team of teenagers with attitudes. Go, go, Power Rangers! The series opens on the strongest note it could have. Ron Wasserman's electric riff that makes you hyped for watching heroes in brightly colored outfits fighting rubber-suited monsters. This theme may be simple, but it is beyond golden. The bass, the guitar, the drums, all of it builds to the point where you hear that phrase for the first time, Go Go Power Rangers, and it keeps building from there. The only problem I have is they should not have had the series recap part at the beginning. Yes, it works for other episodes, but to have that before we ever see the characters, I don't know, it just feels off. Maybe it would have been better uh, having a cold open for the first episode, but that might just be me. Regardless of my feelings, though, as the song ends, we follow a spaceship that lands on some planetoid or other foreign space object that has gotten really close to our moon. If you think the dumpster is on the moon, look again. You can see the moon in the background. Yes, Rita's palace may be on the moon, but the dumpster is not. Anyways, the two astronauts land their spaceship and go off to inspect a strange object on the planetoid, aka the dumpster. However, part of me needs to pause here right here and wonder, is this how Zordon and an organization that won't be revealed for another five-ish seasons, Nasada, got into contact? Did Zordon contact them after their astronauts accidentally released Rita, or was Zordon and already in contact? 
coordinating with them. Food for thought. Anyways, as the dumpster is opened, four monsters has been released, followed by the big bad herself, Rita, who blows up her prison and decides to attack Earth. You don't really get a good feel for any of the baddies just yet, but they do look imposing. At Earthy's Juice and Gin Bar Youth Center, here we get introduced in a bit of a montage to our five main characters. Kim shows off her agility and grace by doing gymnastics. Zach and Jason spar, with Zach showing off his more dance-like moves, revealing him to be someone who merges dance and martial arts, while Jason is more traditional in his style. Jason getting the point also shows he is the better fighter. We also see Trini doing a meditation kata, followed by Billy showing up with a gi with beginner's belt. Bulk and Skull show up and reveal that the two are the comic relief, as well as revealing their dynamic, with Skull deferring to Bulk. As they are easily floored by Kim and Trini, it cuts back to Rita, who has moved from the planetoid to the moon, where she has her palace, and the way she talks makes you think she didn't make it, but found it. More food for thought. A little time seems to have passed as Jason is now teaching a class. I'm going to guess about 30 minutes for all the students to show up, get their shoes off, get their gear on, get ready for class. Wait, 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 wait. Far off. Did Jason just use Korean while teaching karate? Far off. Yes. Why? Karate is Japanese, not Korean. If you're going to have him use Korean, why not have him be teaching Hapkido or Taekwondo? Also, the form on his tornado kick is a little off. That spin after he kicked would leave him vulnerable in an actual fight. I hope he does not do that in actual combat. So at least his form is better than Bulk's. Also, I know they are the comic relief, but someone should tell Skull to take out his earrings before taking part in a martial arts class. You can lose part of your ear that way. Also, Jason and his students are total dicks. Seriously, one of the first things I was taught in my first martial arts class back in elementary school was do not laugh at the failures of your fellow students. Bulk and Skull may be blowhard bullies, but being bemused by their bumbling bothers me. I'm kind of disappointed in Jason. However, he does redeem himself a bit by reassuring a struggling student in Billy. Though it happens after yet another time skip of about another half hour as Billy is out of his gi and in regular clothes. And so the earth begins shaking as we are introduced to two new characters. Alpha 5, who is freaking out about it being the big one, and Zordon. And like a lot of characters in this first episode, Zordon does not start strongly by asking for overbearing and over-emotional beings to be his superhero team. That is kind of a harsh way to describe the people you want to save the world. Back at the juice bar, we see several people running, but our main characters are rooted in place, talking about something feeling weird. Now, this is something I've always wondered about. Are they talking about the earthquake, or is there some sort of sensation they feel before they're teleported, and when they're being teleported? If so, how does that feel? As the five make it to the command center, I want to just touch on this really quickly. I absolutely love the design of the command center. I mean, the blinking lights, the consoles, the viewing globe, Zordon's tube. It is an amazing bit of set design, though I think the five are acting a great deal calmer than one should when seeing a giant floating head in a tube and a robot. And here's we get where we get to a part that I always want to rant about. Why are they called dinosaurs? Only two of them are dinosaurs. Seriously, only the T-Rex and the Triceratops are dinosaurs. A Pteranodon, a Sabertooth Tiger, and Mastodon are not dinosaurs. Seriously, they could have called them Paleozords as they are all things dug up by, by paleontologists and it would have made more sense and actually been more aesthetically cool name than dinosaurs. Or, you know, maybe give them all dinosaurs? There are a lot of cool dinosaurs, but I digress. The scene where Zordon shows off the viewing globe and talks about their powers is great as is the first look of their zords, though I have a few things I want to talk about this later. Again, they act way too nonchalant about all this. Seriously, a giant talking head and a robot told them 
They get to be superheroes, and they turn it down. I'm sorry, but no. Nobody would say no to that. Even in the 90s, offering a teenager unimaginable power and giant robots, and they say no. And Rita kind of shows herself to be even dumber than that by attacking the rangers when they had chosen not to fight. If she had done nothing, she would have won! <sighs> but the patties are sent down, and the first fight scene is very well choreographed. Billy and Kim, being the two with the least amount of fighting skill, are the first down, with Zack holding on a bit longer with his unique style, and the two best fighters, Trini and Jason, taken down last. I like that. It shows a hierarchy of the skill of the rangers in a way that is through the visual media rather than just telling you outright. Unfortunately, here's the thing I want to talk about. This episode does too much. We don't get enough time with anything. In this first episode, we are introduced to the heroes, the supporting characters, the main villain, her henchmen, the powers, the zords, the megazord, tank mode, battle mode, and power sword. It's exhausting, and at the end... It's exhausting, at the end, to have all that piled on. Honestly, I feel they should have held back on the Megazord battle mode, or in the Power Sword, maybe? Maybe even holding back on the tank mode as well, so we could get more time with the individual Zords? That would have been great. Later Citizens handled this better, but for the first episode, it, it isn't too bad, just bugs me a bit. Zordon's rules are great and make a lot of sense. It's standard superhero stuff, but it's great to hear them stated outright. And the closing scene of the five of them putting their hands together to say Power Rangers as a form of solidarity is classic. Thoughts? It's not the best opener, but it does what it can. A lot of it is rushed and likely would have done better as a two-parter. Probably the reason why a lot of later Ranger seasons have multi-parter openers. None of the characters are fully defined in the first episode, and honestly, the most flushed out characters are Bulk and Skull at the moment. It does set up some of the characters with basic archetypes and details some of the skills they each have. What you do get from them, though, is that they are the quintessential five-man band, with Jason being the leader, Zack the Lancer, Billy the Brain, Kimberly the Heart, and Trini acting as a more agile version of the big guy. You also get a feel that they run the gamut of skepticism, with Billy being the most accepting and wide-eyed at the meeting of Zordon and Alpha 5, to Zack being the most skeptical. Trini winds up in the middle, with Kimberly being on the more skeptical side, and Jason being more accepting but not as accepting as Billy. You get less from Zordon and Alpha, and even less than that from Rita and her minions other than the basics. That being said, Rita's team is also kind of like a dark five-man band with Rita as the leader, Goldar as the Lancer, Finster the Brain, and Squat and Babu being the big guy in heart, respectively. It's actually kind of interesting. Also, four of them have some monkeyish features to them, and Rita comes across as a Wicked Witch with almost... But that was intentional both because of the Sentai where Rita and her followers were inspired by the Wicked Witch of the West and the Flying Monkeys, as well as Power Rangers heavily leaning into that. Still, I like it, even if it is exhausting with how fast everything is. Trivia! Oh boy, is there a lot of trivia for this episode. First, like I said, I only talk Sentai in the trivia or thoughts, and when it comes to the Sentai footage, this episode uses footage from half a dozen different episodes. Including the battle against the Megazord and Goldar being from three different episodes cobbled together. Second, there's a scene left in here from the pilot version where somebody else played Trini. And you can see that actress, Audrey Dubois, for a split second. Third, because of the hodgepodging of multiple Sentai episodes, Goldar's wings keep appearing and disappearing. Also, for a brief second, you can see the team in the wrong cockpit. And lastly, this is the only time they form the Megazord without the power crystals, which are said to be how the Megazord is formed. Which, again, is because of that mashing of episodes. There are more bits of trivia, but heck, go and research yourselves. There are many great Power Rangers resource sites, many of them fan-operated to crowdsource for the info. I would suggest uh, Ranger Database and the Power Rangers Wikia for 
some of them. And with all that said, I think I'm done with this episode. Please, if you enjoyed my content, feel free to like and share. Also, if this is my first episode, but I do have a Patreon. Though I only bring it up because I want to be able to do things like bring on an editor and make the show better. As for next time on Observe the Viewing Globe, we will be taking a look at the first episode of Power Rangers I ever watched. Join me next time.